Hey everyone, welcome to Punkcast. My name is William Maxwell. I'm a student of Web3 and the owner of Punk9527. CryptoPunks are 10,000 uniquely generated characters stored permanently on the Ethereum blockchain. No punk is the same. This is a show dedicated to celebrating the punks behind the punk. My hope for this podcast is that we capture the essence of the punk culture, elevate the brand and the individual behind the punk. One last thing. Projects discussed on the show is not financial advice. Crypto and NFTs are a volatile and risky asset class. Please always do your own research. Other than that, let's go. Hey everyone, <clears throat> welcome back to Punkcast. Today we've got a special punk, uh, number 7642. He's a 280 with messy bed hair and nerd glasses. He's a shark at Punk's Den, a founder at V3 Consulting, which is a consultancy helping creators, startups, and brands thrive in Web3. Please welcome the talented Valco to the show. Valco, how are you? Hey, everybody. I'm uh, doing well. Very excited to be here uh, with Maxwell on the show. This is my very first podcast, so uh, looking forward to it. it. Excited to share some of my stories. Awesome. Um, glad, glad to sort of have you, mate. I, uh, I had my first podcast Well, ba- basically the one that we released early during the week was my first podcast with Joshua. So, um, mm. that was a bit of a scary and daunting task, but, um, a little bit easier, I think for you to, 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 to be on the podcast, I think, um, <laughs> maybe we could, uh, start off with just a simple question. Um, how did you come up with Valco? Like, does Valco have a, a meaning behind it in terms of your anonymous name or doc's name? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, I've always been kind of fascinated with um, like names and um, a lot of the top brands out there in the world have really short names, uh, often like ending in vowels. And so I knew that when I came up with my name and my pseudonym, that it had to be something short. And that sounded like cool and, and badass to me. And and Valco was just kind of a sound um, that I came up with. I've always liked the letter V. Um, and uh after I came up with the word, I checked to see if the ENS domain was available, and it was. And I bought it, registered it for 30 years, I want to say. Uh, <laughs> and turns out it means wolf in Bulgarian. So I'm like the, the wolf <laughs> the wolf of Web3, at least in uh, <laughs> Bulgarian words. Uh, beautiful. And uh, just out of curiosity, why did you, um, I guess, decide to stay anonymous uh, in, in the space? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of just fun. I think generally it's like, it's fun to wear a mask. You know, Halloween's a really fun time of year, you know, it's October now and putting on a mask and, and, you know, hiding your real identity and being someone else for a night can be really fun. But, you know, ultimately I think you sort of start to have, especially initially when the pseudonym is young, you have uh, less strings attached. So you can sort of get down to the your like raw and true self. You can interact and represent and express yourself and engage online in a way um, that is truly you uh, because you don't have to be worried about what people kind of in the real world think about you, um, IRL. Um, but the catch 22 is, you know, eventually over time, your pseudonym will gain notoriety and an audience and a following. And, and, and eventually those things uh, do become anchors of their own regard. Uh, but at the end of the day, like I, I think it's beautiful when you find people that are uh, willing to be like unapologetically themselves. And I think pseudonyms are a great way to kind of spread that cheer uh, around the internet. I, I mean, that's uh, that's awesome, um, and I can sort of see that as well, right? I think I've, I've decided to go anonymous for that particular reason. I could just experiment on Twitter, shit posts, write thoughts, whatever it is, and just experiment. Whereas I think if your name's tied to, you know, a certain brand in real life, uh, you know, a company or a university that you went to, I think you've got an obligation to be, um, you know, uh, reasonably conservative in what you say. Um, mm-hmm. so, so totally relate to that. Yeah, and then um, absolutely, there, there's a security element to it as well. You know, you don't want people to find the IRL target with all the JPEGs. <laughs> exactly. For the paranoid ones of us out there. <laughs> well, like, well, especially the high-priced uh, punks, right? So um, for mm-hmm. sure. Um, and and then maybe just uh, 
you know, if you could just give us a brief introduction to yourself and your background and, and how you sort of found yourself in Web3. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So I, I grew up um, in a big family, one of six kids, five sisters, uh, and our mom was really um, intense and disciplined with us. And we all grew up playing instruments uh, along with a bajillion. Where, where, where are you in the, where are you in the family? Oh, I'm, I'm the second oldest. So I have uh, four younger sisters and, and one older sisters or sister. It's, I just, sorry, I had to jump in there because I actually come from a family of six as well. And I'm, I'm the youngest of six and uh, you don't uh, come across too many families with six kids. Right. So. Also. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the best thing ever. I, I, I attribute a lot of my character and my success uh, to, to coming from a big family. And it's, it's something, you know, I hope to have one day too. Yeah. Awesome. But yeah, I, uh, I grew up in a big family uh, playing the violin, started at the age of three. Um, around the time when I was 15, I, I left the house to go to boarding school. Uh, I toured a bunch of really awesome high schools and only one of them was a boarding school. And when I toured the all boys dorm, I was like, wow, this is so cool. I can have like brothers for the first time. You know, this is cool. So I went there, um, got into sports for the first time, kept up my vi- violin practice. And then ultimately when college came around, I got into Berkeley College of Music on a scholarship and decided to go there to study uh, sound design for video games and music business. So I graduated there uh, with a double bachelor's and a minor in uh, audio implementation for video games. Tried to get a job at at Sonos at the time. Uh, I didn't get the job. It was a little bit disheartening. Uh, But I did meet this really interesting character starting a venture capital brokerage firm. So rather than having a fund where we manage, you know, whatever, $100 million dollars, um, we would bring deals to investors on a direct deal basis. So that really kicked off my career in venture capital. Uh, so I did that for about eight years, got my Series 7, Series 24, and Series 63. So I'm very plugged into the securities world uh, and, and really learned that it was something I didn't like. I didn't like this idea of an accredited investor being somebody who has a net worth or income over a certain threshold, and that being the measure of who is... Uh, sophisticated enough to invest in certain as- asset classes. You know, it was basically saying like, if you're rich, you're smart, and therefore you can have more investment options. And, and that really pissed me off. And so that combined with a lot of my background in, in music business, at least academically, uh, really attracted me to Web3 because I, I saw the the freedom it was going to not just bring uh, the people uh, uh, from an investment angle, but I also saw a lot of the benefits it could provide a, a creator economy, like like musicians, but just a broader creator economy as well. So um, I was in venture capital for eight years in mixed capacities as a venture capital broker, um, helping manage a large um, Fortune 500 company, like an oil and gas company's um, VC fund. And then I switched to crypto full time, where I was chief of staff at Yat Labs and Tari Labs for about a year and a half uh, when I decided it was time to build my own thing, uh, which brings me here. Awesome. Um, what was Yat Labs and uh, what was the other company you mentioned? The Web3 companies? What were they, yeah, what were they so doing? there's uh, Yat Labs, Y-A-T, and Tari Labs, T-A-R-I. They're sort of like brother and sister companies, um, same founders, same team, same engineers, you know, whole nine yards. Um, Tari Labs was building its own blockchain. So it's a layer one that's built in Rust, which is a very high performance, but notoriously hard to develop for um, kind of language. And um, the whole angle on on Tari was like, we believe um, that there needed to be a private by default layer one that supported smart contracts. So sort of like as Monero is to Bitcoin, Tari was to Ethereum. Um, we, we wanted something that wasn't just private by default, uh, which we, which we viewed to be very important, but we also wanted something that was more scalable than Ethereum, which like we, we all know the problems with Ethereum scalability, which are being addressed right now. But yeah, that was, that was Tari. Um, one of the founders was the ex lead maintainer of, uh, Monero. So it was a really, uh, well funded, well resourced, uh, well staffed startup. And within that, we had another company called Yat which is a uh, emoji-based self-sovereign identity for Web3. Uh, so think of it as something like a, an ENS or an unstoppable domains type thing. Like on the surface, it's, it's like those things. It serves as like a URL 
and like a link in bio and like a link tree and all that jazz. But um, Yat was purely emoji based. Um, and Yat also had a much greater focus on sort of onboarding the normies uh, via like really powerful storytelling quality. I mean, we're talking like top tier, best in class UI and UX. And so, um, you know, we onboarded tens and tens and tens of thousands of new users to Web3 with this neat little um, emoji based identity. And that, and that was, um, that included people like Paris Hilton, Steve Cohen, Lil Wayne, uh, like, you know, hot shots, but it also included anybody with $4. Um, and so it was a really amazing startup to be a part of really bright team. And, and what I liked a lot was we, we successfully brought in a lot of new users to web three, which is ultimately what I'm here for. That's awesome. Mate. I, um, I do remember that I, I actually bought a couple yats. Um, I've just pulled up now. I got the, 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 uh, the cool orange cap. So the cool was the, <laughs> with the sunglasses. Yeah. Um, but, uh, that's, that, that, that's really awesome. Do you, what, do you know what's going on with yat at the moment? Are they still, still going strong? Oh yeah. Yeah. The team is, uh, growing and, uh, they're, they're constantly kind of refining and upgrading the product. So I think historically, a lot of the focus was on, um, you know, bringing utility to the identity, um, which is still something that matters, you know, yats are essentially primary domains and opera browser. So if you just type the emoji in the URL, it automatically resolves to that yat owner's page or redirects to where they want, which is really cool anywhere in the opera web browser that um, you highlight a string of emojis. Like if it's owned by that person, it'll say go to yat. So if you own the single emoji heart, theoretically, nobody does. You would own on opera that namespace across the entire internet. So it's really, cool. really powerful. It's an amazing integration. There's also integrations with crypto wallets, like similar to ENS and MetaMask integration, where you could send money to valco.eth. Um, with Cake Wallet, My Monero Wallet, um, Blockchain.com Wallet, which has a, a whole bunch of users, you can send money using Yats. But you know, beyond that, they're they're building a really cool product right now called Yat Pods. So rather than being fully reliant on outside integrations, um, they're sort of taking fate into their own hands and building this really cool um, social product that helps people and groups sort of collect together um, and help people tell their on-chain stories because just owning an NFT or not, and when you bought it, that's that's kind of like a surface level story. But there's so many more stories beneath the surface of bravery and riches and ruin and cowardice that like, unless you're an expert on chain digging and on Etherscan, like these stories are hard to tell. So the new product that Yat's working on is very much about what are the, these mutually shared assets that people have and what are their on-chain stories and how can we help them connect and tell these stories. That's awesome, um, mate. And and uh, just want to, just want to go back a little bit because I'm looking at uh, this uh, Twitter post, and as you were sort of going through your background, you know, you know, get the get the fact that you moved out early and early age, and you come from a really unique background in music, um, which I don't think we find too often in Web three. But uh, I think I'm looking at point number five here. You've got um, Mongolian throat singer. Um, is, is that is that real or? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's real. I mean, we, <laughs> we sat around in college and, and watched all sorts of weird YouTube videos. Like people would come over, bring a bottle of whiskey and someone would start air playing something and the night would just devolve into like complete nonsense. But one thing we always came back to was Mongolian throat singing. We thought it was like so fascinating. Um, people sound like a didgeridoo <laughs> and, and one done right, you can actually sing two notes at once. Uh, super fascinating. We always thought like, uh, you have to be a, of a certain genetic pool to be able to do this thing. Um, like only few are capable, but like, lo and behold, like all 10 of us learned how to do it. And I, I'll do a little demo for you. It, it might sound weird on the mic, but it sounds kind of like, <laughs> like this. <What> do do? <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> Yeah. So it, uh, this wasn't like 12 truths and a lie, uh, or 11 truths and a lie. That, that is very much a real party trick I've got. I love it. Yeah. You're right. It does actually sound like a didgeridoo, right? Um, mm -hmm. 
Uh, mate, you've got you've got a really rich uh, and, uh, and and sort of exciting background here, and um, yeah, maybe um, you, you could sort of tell us about uh, your, your foray into NFTs. Then, I mean, was it through Yat and that sort of space when you bought your first NFT? Like, what was that like? Yeah, um, well, uh, I've been in the NFT space for a long time. So I, I originally got involved in Bitcoin when I was in. Um, like high school, like in the very early days of Bitcoin. So dating myself a little bit there. Um, mm-hmm. And we we were buying like illicit things online, you know, as high schoolers do. And so I, I saw Bitcoin kind of come to the fold. I saw the power of it, not just as like a superior form of like money and, and store of value, but as, as something you could actually use to buy things online. And then enter college. I saw this whole ICO and shitcoin era. And I, I didn't really have any interest in that because that's on the speculative and gambling side of the spectrum that I've never been a fan of. Um, but when NFTs enter the fold, I, you know, I, I thought it was really interesting. So Berkeley's mascot is is Mingus the cat. We're a music school. We have no sports teams. But it, our mascot is a cat. And of course, cats are really powerful internet memes. Um, and I'm a big time, long time Redditor. And so when I saw um, the headlines, you know, and I was a Bitcoin maximalist at this point in my life. And, and Ethereum to me was like equivalent to Litecoin. It was kind of just like this another chain out there that had some legitimacy, but wasn't fully legit. And so when I saw this headline saying CryptoKitties breaks the Ethereum blockchain, like I just like peed my pants. I thought it was the funniest thing ever. I was like, here we go. Like the shit coins in for us breaking, like Bitcoin's the best. Um, and so at that point in time, I was like, I have to get some of these little cats. So in December, December 5th, 2017, and this is one of my on-chain stories, um, December 5th, 2017, I bought two crypto kitties and two crypto punks. And I found the kitties first, um, was on Reddit, bopping around, and quickly I was pointed to, I think it was like a crypto punk specific subreddit. And I was like, wow, these, these things look way cooler. And so uh, I went ahead and... Um, purchased my uh, two punks. I didn't mint them, but I got them in 2017 um, before the dawn of the ERC 721 standard. And um, I held them every day since. I never got rid of them. So that's still super early. What, what was your um, entry price? So you got in December 17, right? Yeah, I, I was like point. 1.3 and 0.14 ETH. I mean, my cost basis for my punks is, is like cumulatively like $300 USD. Wow. And is, is that the one that uh, you're, you're sporting today? The uh, number, is it 7642? No. So actually, when I, when I said I didn't get rid of them, I, I should correct myself. So I, I did take the two I originally had and I, I sort of sold them and turned them into five. Um, mm. So I, I bought two hoodie punks originally. Um, right. and I sold them sort of like in 2020 or 2021, like many years later, but before this stuff really took off. And one of yeah. them I sold for five ETH. And of course, hoodie punks are worth like way more now, like the floor for hoodie punks, is like 200 ETH. But I sold one of my hoodie punks for five ETH and used that money to buy the one I have now, um, seven, six, four, two, which really spoke to me. I thought it was such a clean punk, um, kind of looks like me. Uh, and it, it just has this cool, like high IQ smarty pants vibe. It always reminded me of, uh, L and the main character, Light Yagami and Death Note. I don't know if you watched that anime, but, um, no. they're both these like really brilliant characters with glasses that like occasionally catch the light and flicker at you. And, and that's what kind of spoke to me about these punks. So I, I turned two punks into five, but I've been in the punk collection, um, without skipping a day since December 5th, 2017. That's amazing. And then that's super early. So I'm super jealous there, but, um, so maybe, maybe if you can t- take us back to that time, cause I'm always really curious, um, in terms of what it was like back then, uh, how did you come across crypto kitties and, and then obviously into crypto punks that would, you know, compelled you to take it to the next step? Because I know a lot of people hear about it, but they don't really take the next step to actually action it. Yeah. I mean, with CryptoKitties, it was, it was kind of just like, I'm on the internet, you know, I'm on Reddit, I'm reading tech forums, all sorts of things. And, and so the CryptoKitties breaks the Ethereum blockchain. Like if you were remotely in crypto, or even if you weren't exposed to crypto, like financially, but sort of lurked around those forums, like you saw this headline 
And so I thought it was absolutely funny. I've always appreciated like the power of the cat meme on the internet. And so I saw that and I was like, you know what? Screw it. Like I'm gonna buy some of these things and I'm gonna start breeding them. You know, I thought it was so funny that you could breed your cats or you could have people pay you money to breed with your cat. I was like, I can pimp out my cats, like cool. (laughs) So that was just like fun from a gamer's perspective. Um, and then the punks, I just thought they looked cool. And I, I really wanted to have one just like as an experiment um, on the blockchain. Like I, it was my first time getting my own self-custody wallet, um, you know, and, and, and buying like an NFT. So it was, it was really just an experiment. But very quickly, these punks became like an identity for me. I was rocking a punk as a PFP that day in 2017. And so I think whether I was able to articulate it or not, I saw the value of these things as a sort of new identity for your, uh, a new face for your digital identity. And that's what initially attracted me. And then I would say like my conviction really grew over time. Like, you know, every day I turned away massive profits to stay in the collection. And I think my, my, my conviction started to come really from realizing like one, oh shit, crypto punks really ignited this movement. They're the first like 10k pfp collection and at the time we all thought it might have been the first nft so i knew it had historical significance um so that was a big anchor in my conviction over time but also it was the community like i i started to see some like really bright really deeply intellectual folks entering the crypto punk community and uh it was like a club i knew i wanted to be a part of for life and so like i'll never sell punk 7642 um, I, I will literally never sell that thing. It's going to be passed down to like my kin. Awesome. And there's a, uh, there's a lot of things to sort of unpack there as well. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you was, was, was it quite common for people to use their CryptoPunk as the identity play back then? Cause I'm assuming, you know, Twitter and discord weren't, were basically just starting out. Um, you know, was yeah. was there a, a lot? I mean, even on Reddit, right? Was Reddit did Reddit have a profile profile picture identity play there as well? Or? Reddit, Reddit, you have to um, you have to be one of those little aliens, and you can you can change the way the alien looks, kind of like in a video game. You know, change its accessories, whatever its shirt, its pants. On Reddit, you can't have your own custom PFP. But I, I don't remember what day the the Punk Discord started or when I joined it. Uh, and I imagine that was probably the the place where punk PFPs started because you were in a community with your fellow punks and you wanted to wear your little punk mask. Um, mm-hmm. The Twitter community, it took me kind of years to find it. Like I was solo rocking my punk PFP on Twitter just because I thought it was cool. You know, this hoodie guy with a VR headset really looked like a cyberpunk of sorts. I even imported him into Microsoft Paint and created like a little torso and body for him. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Like it's it's kind of just like blurred with history. Like at, at some point, like it, it just kind of became like when crypto Twitter blossomed, like that's when NFT PFPs started like taking the limelight, taking the stage. Booming. Yeah, no, cool. And, and so it would be you... good to ask about that is uh, Shuli. She would, Shuli would know. Um, oh, yeah. she's like yep. the OG creator of our discord. Yeah. I think I'll get her on the show, uh, uh, soon. So yeah, definitely I'll ask her then as well. Um, and when you said, when you said you started, you know, engaging with the community, like how, what was that like? Like who, like what sort of channels and was it mostly Reddit? Um, was there a Reddit crypto punk channel there before discord happened or, um, yeah, crypto punk. There was a, a Reddit that um, that's what initially turned me on to to punks, but I don't remember it being active, or if it was, I wasn't active in it. It was just sort of how I initially discovered the collection um, as something adjacent to crypto kitties, uh, and and then you know it, it very quickly became like Discord and Twitter, uh, and so I think my early engagements with the community were you know it was just kind of like chatting. You know, there were there were newcomers coming into the project. It was before all this hype, so there there actually wasn't like a whole lot to talk about, and I don't mm-hmm. think there were a whole lot of people with like crazy, crazy, crazy conviction. Uh, like I don't think anyone foresaw like where we are today. And maybe few people did, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it, there wasn't a whole lot of things to talk about. And then when the NFT bull run came, uh, I observed like a lot of the punks. You know, initially we're talking about 
other projects coming up, trying to figure out which ones were going to be hot, which ones were going to be not. Um, but very quickly, I think the punks became very indifferent to these new projects. They were like, this is all noise. Punks are the only things that matter. Um, which led a lot of us to miss out on like stuff like Bored Apes that actually sort of defied the odds. Um, but yeah, a lot of punks sort of became numb to all the noise and then went out and started building. So for a long mm -hmm. time, the, I, I felt the punk community was actually a little dormant because they were contributing elsewhere in the space. But now there's such a strong community in that Discord, people talking every day, new awesome people joining. I mean, I, I really do think it's the best club on the internet. Absolutely. Um, man, that, that's super, super fascinating to, uh, to go back that, that far. And I think, what, what about you? Like when you were going through that process as well, I mean, was the concept of, you know, digital ownership of pictures or digital property rights, um, automa automatically make sense to you, um, back then, or did that take you a bit of time to sort of, um, sort of digest? I think. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I always understood digital ownership with regards to like money and, and Bitcoin. And so it wasn't a huge leap for me to like understand that with regards to like a unique digital asset and, and, and somebody, you know, my background as a gamer, you know, helped me too. Right. I played a lot of RuneScape. Mm -hmm. I, I owned a lot of rare items in RuneScape and, and other video games and MMORPGs. The idea of owning like a unique digital item, was not very far fetched for me. Yeah. Um, and I think the one thing that a lot of my friends challenged me on, the people calling me crazy all along the way, were like, you know, what do you really own? Like the image isn't really on the blockchain, uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, they're just pointers. Mm. And, you know, for a vast majority of collections, that's true. But as we know, like CryptoPunks had a really innovative like method where they, they took the composite image of all the punks, they ran it through the SHA 256. Um, like encryption algorithm and they took the hash and they put that on chain. So there's like, there's some semblance of like what the images are on chain. And it's not like, you know, more recently they actually put the images on chain, like all the RGB color data. But uh, that was something that was very powerful to me too. was like there being something more than just a pointer. Um, whereas like today you look at a lot of projects, it's just a pointer, sometimes pointing to a centralized server that could be fully changed at any point in time like an Amazon or a Google or a Microsoft server, or you have, you know, the, the middle ground of like, it's on IPFS, which is like supposed to be immutable, but it's obviously not a blockchain. So mm. yeah. 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 No, I, I didn't really appreciate, uh, I guess the on-chain um, provenance of that uh, until a little bit later in, uh, I guess my NFT journey. But mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely right. I don't think many people coming into the space, um, really sort of understand that difference as well between IPFS and actually real on-chain, right. um, which is a really special uh, feature of CryptoPunks as well. Um, man, so that's a, that's a really cool uh, sort of, uh, you know, foundation and, and sort of finding your way into CryptoPunks. And then, um, and then and you sort of did talk about it a little bit, um, but maybe we can go a little bit deeper into, you know, why did this particular... Uh, punk that you have now actually resonate with you uh, the most. Uh, it was it, you said that it was, um, uh, I think it was that was it uh, a, 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 an old cartoon or something like that. Yeah, the, the glasses reminded me of um, some of my favorite characters from the anime Death Note. But I would say like okay. glasses kind of glinting and glistening in the sunlight is a kind of common anime trait. And I've watched a whole lot of anime, so I saw these glasses and immediately spoke to me like high IQ. And I wanted my face online to be of somebody who was smart. I wanted to talk about cool ideas, not not things and, and people necessarily. And uh, so that's what originally attracted me to it. And it's just clean. Like I, I liked punks that were very clean and look like they could be somebody IRL. Like I, I never personally was drawn to some of the crazy hair punks or the ones with the eyeshadow, like nothing against those punks. Like I think all punks are awesome. A punk's a punk. Um, but personally for me, I really was drawn to the clean punks that didn't have a whole lot going on. Awesome. And then, um, yeah. So, so man, like, uh, so, so tell us like, what are you, um, what are you working on now? And I guess, you know, what are you sort of finding really interesting in this space? Yeah. So, uh, I'm, uh, working on my own consulting practice. So I've landed a few um, clients and 
um, really on helping creators, startups, small brands, big brands um, launch themselves and thrive into Web3. So helping people with NFT drops, um, tokenomics, sort of how they structure their smart contracts, helping them um, maybe come up with like how their DAO will be structured, governance models for their DAO, um, how they're going to build their product or their DAP, or or for some projects like what 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 is their like strategy to even like before they start building like what's their kind of go to market and entrance strategy to take a Web two brand and move it into Web three in a way that's not just like a cash grab but something that's actually organic and sustainable. So uh, kind of all over the the board right now, but really the overarching mission is how can I um, bring Web three to the masses. And so really just looking for the most fun, the most enjoyable, cool projects with cool people. Nice. And um, just out of curiosity as well, like what, what, what uh, sort of channels are you using to uh, try and source business? Because I've had a look on, because I was thinking something similar as well, um, but I just sort of felt like Web2 is just really hard to um, communicate effectively with them. Um, maybe that's my, mm. my, my sort of communication style, but I was just on LinkedIn and I was having a look through, uh, I guess some of the feeds there and, and how they talk about web three and crypto and blockchains. I guess the key things always keep popping up. It's like metaverse, um, digital sort of avatars, fashion. Um, and, and it just feels like it's a lot of buzzwords and a lot of the people that are giving advice feel like they're not really down in the weeds as we are in some ways. And so when you talk about those elements, which are really important in my mind about launching a project around tokenomics, around, you know, fair launch and all those other bits and pieces, they basically signal a lot of things about the project where, whereby a lot of people coming in from web two are probably approaching it top down. And I think they miss on some of the nuances and I think it's a massive missed opportunity. So, you know, I definitely think that there's a, there's a gap there for some consulting work. Yeah, no, I I absolutely agree. I I, I mean, like I, I use Twitter to focus on like the DAOs and kind of crypto native startups um, from a business development standpoint. Uh, and and LinkedIn's really powerful for finding some of the non crypto native creators or um, especially like bigger brands. And then of course, like typical networking, going to events and and referrals can can take you a long way. Um, I always take the approach of like trying to provide value first, like without um, like expectation of anything in return. Cause I think if, if you provide value, then like good things will generally come to you and, and sure that means sometimes you um, do something for free um, or it might feel like you wasted your time, but I really feel like there's like an education and everything. And, you know, I, a lot of people that I've a year ago hopped on calls with sometimes for an hour or three just to help them work through something like a lot of those guys have come back to me um, as clients themselves or referred friends as a client. So I, I really take things from that um, perspective, really try to like explore their ideas with them, poke holes in them, um, make sure it's really making meaningful impact and progress towards whatever their company's objection uh, objectives are. Uh, and then eventually that usually will like, you know, uh, lead to some sort of like trial period, like a consulting trial period. At which point, like after a month, we both know like whether there's real value in us working together or not. And so far, that's been a hundred percent conversion rate. But uh, yeah, it's it, it's pretty fun. No, it is, and uh, no, I'm excited for you too, man. And um, and when, when you're when you're sort of going through, I guess this journey, this process, like what, what are you are you sort of seeing some consistent friction areas or barriers that you that you come across, whether it's sort of Web three clients or Web two clients coming across into Web three. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people um, don't actually understand the paradigm shift that's happening with our infrastructure here, like the the fundamental differences between Web 2 infra and Web 3 infra. A lot of people look at crypto and they just sort of see money bags, frankly. And a lot of people think that crypto and blockchain and um, whatever, making something a DAO, they really view it as this like magic bullet to um, the business model side of the equation. But I always tell them like, look, this is just like a new medium to transact. It's a new medium for art. Uh, DAOs are just like an on-chain LLC effectively. Like none of these things are 
magic bullets for you as a creator or a company. Like if you don't, if you don't put out good, valuable content or product or services, like blockchain isn't going to be your saving grace. Um, so th- that's something I always have to sort of like beat through their heads initially and get them to stop seeing the money bags. Cause like a lot of them say they want to build organic, sustainable things, but initially a lot of their ideas are very cash grabby. It's like sell this PFP, collect the money. And it's like, and then what? Uh, and there's oftentimes not a then what? And I think it's still a big problem that even the most deeply crypto native folks are struggling to solve. Like, look around how many projects actually have a sustainable recurring revenue model that's not just royalties, right? It's very few. I mean, the one that always comes to mind for me is nouns. Like, they sell a noun every day for like 50 to 60 Ethereum. And I think it's a really good model that they have to keep their project well funded. Um, for now and like arguably forevermore. Um, but yeah, I think that's the struggle is like, how do you come in and create something sustainable? And how do you get the clients to really think that way versus being focused on like short term cash grabs? Cause, cause Web3 has always been like the promised land for creators. Like they, they think like, oh, finally, like royalties are going to be guaranteed and save the day. And we're all going to be able to finally make money selling music, selling art, selling content. But at the end of the day, like there's a power law distribution and in, in the world of creators, only some creators make it and many don't. And Web3 is not going to change that, in my opinion. It might create tighter in, uh, alignment of incentives between fans and, um, and creators. It might create stronger communities that are like can't be deplatformed or canceled, right? There's a direct connection and on-chain social graph between these creators and their fans. Um, but like what these creators are doing at the end of the day, it's, it's still the same stuff. So if they're not providing value on like a recurring basis, then like blockchain is not going to save the day for them. And so I think that's been like the real, um, struggle. It's kind of like the simple things, like what are you guys actually doing? Uh, what are you actually trying to achieve and what value are you providing to your community? Um, and, uh, not, not an audience, but like a community, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I, there's a couple of things that you said there that is really interesting. I think, you know, definitely the cash grabby piece. I think that's a, a really difficult one to unwind if you're coming from Web2, right? Um, you know, you come from a world where companies and centralization and your primary purpose is to extract profits. And you're moving to sort of Web3, it's like, well, um, it's not so much about transactions anymore. You've got an opportunity to build and accrue attention for the long term through communities and if you can accrue and attract attention for the long term then there's different ways to monetize that and i sort of feel like a lot of the web 2 companies that are coming in are uh, are really struggling with this concept of transactional versus a long-term type play Mm -hmm. um and uh yeah so um yeah i'm not sure how we sort of get around that right because i think it's just naturally um sort of embedded and wide wide into us um but uh, but man, like it's a uh, it sounds like a really um, uh, interesting place to sort of be, and I think we need to start from somewhere, right? So um, it's great to sort of see that people like you with um, big brains and the experience to sort of uh, guide uh, guide these businesses through. Um, cool. So um, right, uh, and then and then what's so what's sort of next for you? Then you're just gonna continue pushing. Um, consulting and um for the for the meantime yeah i'm i'm just you know it's so fun to work on all these different projects and it's also such a a relief to really be in charge of my own time i've had a lot more time to spend with my family and my friends and and traveling you know i'm I'm not working 80 hours a week anymore Uh, i'm working much more normal hours and everything's on my own time so i think i'm going to keep this up for a while but uh I, i i definitely have a whole lot of you know, I, I can call myself an entrepreneur because I started my own little consulting practice, fine. But uh, I really um, admire people who have gone out and built like, you know, big startups, big, big products. And um, I haven't had like an idea that has motivated me to like really take the leap of faith and, and go all in on. But I think as soon as I have some um, interesting value proposition or, or problem to like really chew on, that I would love to um, start my own uh, company at some point. And I, I definitely view that as probably something in the in the Web3 space, although I, I am also very passionate about broader just investing, like 
you know, hel- helping people reach financial independence, helping people um, like the Robin Hood DGENs actually like invest with purpose. So we'll awesome. see. Uh, but it, it, I don't think it's out of the question in the next two years that uh, I either join another startup team uh, or, or start one of my own. Awesome. Mate, um, and then just digressing a little bit, I'm just uh, looking at um, your uh, your Looks Rare wallet because I can't access the OpenSea one for at the moment. But um, uh, just having a look at your collection here, you've got uh, an interesting collection, mostly CryptoPunks, Cryptodes, and some art blocks in here. But uh, just throwing a broad question out there for you, like, you know, you know, what what do you what do you like collecting the most? And and I guess more importantly, what why do you collect? Yeah. Um, yeah. So my bag right now, um, I, I don't really like, I'm kind of a tortoise in this space. Like I don't really move or do things that much. Like yeah, I have like pretty high conviction around, like I'd say historical NFTs. Um, I own punks. I own V1 punks. I own me bits. Uh, I own some Genesis rocks, some cryptodes and some of the identity stuff like ENS, YATS, uh, the, the more recently found Linigy um dot og ones i have some art blocks and then i've supported some punk native projects so like i'd say for the most part like if it's not historical and i got into it it's probably because i'm supporting my friends um otherwise i i really like any new money i accumulate or profits like i'm going to be buying more, more punks with that um that's sort of like my my highest conviction asset in this entire space um and i i think anything else like you know, I wouldn't be comfortable going into a coma for 10 years holding anything else besides punks or like autoglyphs. So, and that's kind of the lens I take is like, buy it, set it, forget it. Like if you're trying to time the market, you're probably just gambling. Um, so why bother? Just, you know, the, the punks are in my opinion, like in the stock world, um, the S&P is like the benchmark to beat. If you're an active fund manager and you can beat the S&P, then good on you. Most people can't. So they should just buy and hold the S&P. Um, and in crypto, I'd say the benchmark is very much Bitcoin. If you can beat the HODL, that of your time and that of your taxes, then good on you. Most people can't. They're just gambling. And then in, in the NFT world, I really think like if you can beat punks over time, net of your time, however you value that, and that of your increased tax obligation, right? Because when you trade, you pay more taxes than just holding. Um, if you can beat punks, then good on you. Uh, and, and, and for me, I just have this kind of general philosophy, like you can try to beat the index, but over 10 to 20 to 30 years, very, very, very few people do, are able to do that. Even the top hedge fund managers are un, not able to consistently beat the market. So for me in NFT land, my whole thing is just dollar cost average and accumulate punks, which you can do. Like if you're bullish on NFTs, my opinion, and obviously I have bag bias here, but I tell this to my my mom and my my sisters and my loved ones and my friends. If you're bullish on NFTs and you do not have exposure to punks, I have no idea what you're doing. And that's not to say, oh, you need to be rich to get a punk. Like, no, go to NFTX, deploy $1 to get punk exposure. Now that probably wouldn't be optimal because of gas fees, but I mean, you get the idea. Like you can dollar cost average punks the same way you can dollar cost average Bitcoin. And, just, and so just get, just going back on that then you know what what's your underlying thesis with um punks then what, why do you have so much conviction into it i think you sort of mentioned historical but it'd be good to hear from you in terms of why yeah i mean i'd say like first and foremost i i think the community is amazing so like there is real time present value in being in the community i've met so many amazing people that are doing so many awesome things that have just had a positive like personal effect on my life, let alone a business and professional effect on my life. But I'd say like that alone, like when you buy a punk, you're in a community of awesome people. It's it's kind of the same as if you go and join Soho House or some other members only club. You're in a club of like elite people by some measure of eliteness. Um, and that's cool. But for the long term, like I at the end of the day, like every 10K PFP project in my opinion, is a derivative work of punks. And it might not be a direct, like, you know, soul punks or something that has punks in the name or visually looks like punks. But the idea is like the very first 10,000 generative profile picture project or NFT was punks. 
and mm-hmm. the entire space caught fire with this idea of 10 kpfps so it, it really is the thing it, punks defined a new medium and it, it's not just to say they defined the 10 kpfp medium like the erc 721 standard itself was built off of the innovations that CryptoPunks made on the fungible ERC-20 contract. So when you like look at those two things together, like I think history and and when NFTs like take over the world, um, we will look back as punks as the thing that sparked the movement. And sure, they weren't the very first NFT, right? There are NFTs that predate punks, but they were the NFT that inspired the 10K PFP movement that lit fire to the space. And they were the NFT that inspired the ERC-721 NFT token standard. And I think those two things are are very important to point out. And then I'd say the third thing is like, it's a very decentralized project. It's not um, dependent on the centralized efforts of some royalty funded hype machine. Like punks just are. The Discord itself is run by the community. Like punks don't need any utility other than the art and the community itself. Um, so it, there's no risk of those things like crumbling and fading away. Like those things will always be there. They're very robust and reliable. Um, we don't know if like all these other NFT projects, founders and marketing machines and Twitter accounts are going to be there for the long term. They're not like truly decentralized in my opinion. And I, so I view punks as a project that not just pioneered the space and brought popularity to a new medium for art and digital assets. But um, I also just, you know, view it as this very um, robust, reliable, run by the people project, which I think is super fascinating. Absolutely. Right. Um, you've just got me even more bullish on, on punks. <laughs> <laughs> I need to stack those, uh, stack those chips. And um, mate, so, that's a that's a really uh, good take as well, and I agree with with all of them, and I think couldn't agree more strongly with I guess the 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 provenance and the 10k provenance piece, you know. And I keep saying this all the time: is everything that is a 10k PFP is in some ways a derivative of CryptoPunks. I think um, uh, the uh, the concept of identity is just such a huge huge piece to sort of unlock, right? And there were NFTs that came before CryptoPunks, but CryptoPunks were the ones that did. The PFP, the identity play. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's that's the one that's really driving a lot of the movement going forward. And yeah, and on like a more micro level, like you can look at attributes and see the provenance back to punk. Like three D glasses have existed in the world for a long time, but punks brought three D glasses, like the meme, to the NFT space. Punks brought this idea of like aliens, apes, zombies. Like these things have all Hoodies. existed. Yeah, hoodies Even exactly, and so caps, yeah. If, you look across all these other NFT projects when they have those traits, it's really an homage to punks, especially when it's a rare trait in punks. And it also happens to be a rare trait in their collection. Like that is such a strong collection of punks. I mean, look at board ape yacht club, arguably the most successful NFT project in the space right now. They're apes, right? Like maybe I'm going out on a limb here, but like I view that as something that was very much inspired by the apes as a type in CryptoPunks. And if you look at all the individual attributes of, of board apes, a lot of them pay reference and homage back to punks. Absolutely. Um, I wonder if this is going to cause a bit of a shit still when we post uh, some of your quotes here with the board ape community, but uh, let, let, let's try that, try that out. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't, I don't view it as like, you know, tribal <laughs> warfare, m- m- maybe before the Yuga acquisition it was, but we are, we are bound by blood now. Exactly. Um, it was it was kind of interesting when you were talking a, a little bit before about um, you know when board apes came on the scene. You know, CryptoPunks was you know in some ways a little bit dismissive of the the emerging board apes, and it's been quite a st- telling story uh, to date. But I sort of feel like that's sort of what's happening with the Bitcoin maxis at the moment. Um, with Ethereum, with the- yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and I hope, hope you know, and, and I hope I I manage to keep it a bit more of an open mind as we sort of go through. But it's hard, right? I think when you're just so entrenched with with history and crypto punks and how much you sort of appreciate the collection and, and what what it is, um, it's hard to sort yeah, of yeah, no, totally. I I think it's easy for people to focus on their missed opportunities. Like I I can sit here all day long and say, dang, you know, because I was such a punk maxi and 
didn't believe in all these silly animal PFP projects that I ignored because they were noise, you know, because I had that mentality, I missed out on board apes. But what if I didn't have that mentality? How much money would I have lost to all these other projects? Right? Like, so I don't know. I'm, I'm happy to have my punks. I want to keep buying punks. I very much like denominate my like NFT worth in punks. Makes sense. Right. Um, and then if you, if you reflect back on your, I guess your NFT trading history or your, tra- your NFT sort of experience, um, is there any sort of single point uh, that you would classify as your best win or moment in NFTs? I mean, I think, I think the biggest win is definitely like buying my punk in 2017 and like never exiting the collection, like staying exposed to the punk collection. I traded up within it. You know, I turned two hoodies into five beautifully clean punks that I I love with all my heart and I wouldn't change that for the world. That's probably the biggest win of all. Um, The next big win I would say is I do have my V1 um, pair for my main punk. So I have the complete set for punk 7642. Uh, which yep. I'm really pumped about. I, I had to pay a little bit of an arm and a leg for that. I think I paid like 20 ETH for the V1 oh, wow. Punk, which was which was a, around a peak for the V1 Punk. So I kind of bought the top on that, but yeah, I really have no regrets. Like there are a few people who have um, their complete sets, and I'm really proud to be a part of that community, especially as someone who, you know, I had to kind of buy my way into that. I, I didn't mint my Punk, so I didn't. You know, the people who minted their V1 Punks were airdropped their equivalent v2 if we want to call it that punk mm. and so those guys kind of had had those their sets off the bat mm. um, but i came in obviously bought my crypto punk on a secondary market and the v1 was just out there in the world and you know five years later i was able to catch it and uh super pumped about that and my third biggest win i would say is um genesis rocks um i i bought or actually i got gifted a, a genesis rock for free and uh, I ended up selling it to Gary Vaynerchuk for 20 Ethereum, which was like $60,000 at the time. And uh, it, it, it broke headlines. Like it was on Mashable. <laughs> there's like a, there's a Mashable article saying like Logan Paul spends $150,000 on an <laughs> NFT rock. And the article like quotes a, a really cool thread I wrote uh, on the Genesis rock um, movement. And uh, I mean, that, that was a really fun time to be that alive. That was cool. I got to dig that one up. Actually, I mean, I'm interested. Uh, that, I do remember that sort of phase. It was a bit of a super hype cycle phase at one people buying rocks, and then, <laughs> yeah. um, and then uh, just actually one question I wanted to ask you. I mean, what's your take on the V ones? Um, I know they've been a little bit uh, controversial um, coming into the space, but um, what what's your sort of take on them? Yeah, I mean, it, it gets really heated because. A lot of people's like bags are on the line. And I think a lot of people, like a lot of their net worth is tied up in these bags, whether it's V1 punks or, or crypto punks. Uh, so it, it can get very, very heated. And a lot of people like to call V1s as a, uh, uh, people like grifters or scammers. But, you know, at the end of the day, like, um, V1s are part of crypto punks story. Um, V1s existed two weeks before crypto punks. They were the first failed attempt of crypto punks. And, and that's what they are. Uh, and, and the market and you and, and the world can decide to value that however they want. Um, but V1 punks were the punks that people minted. Crypto punks that are the popularized collection today were airdropped to V1 holders. So those are just the facts. One came first and the other one came second. You know, the popularized crypto punks are an airdrop. The original ones are a failed mint. And, um, that's just, that's the story. And so for me, I I wanted exposure to both. Both were published by Larva Labs. They are both legit. They both have the same cryptographic hash of the composite image of all the punks, but one of them has it first. And that's not to say like, I'm a V1 maxi. Like I, I own both. I rock my V2 crypto punk as my PFP and my main face for the internet. And I personally don't think the V1s will flip the V2s in value. Um, they right now are sort of tracking at like, I guess like a 10th of their value or something like that. Maybe it's a little more, but um, I think that's natural and I think that's okay. And I think they will always be part of the punk story and to tell the punk story without V1s 
or to say that V1 punks are like scammers, I think is a, a little bit um, short-sighted. Uh, I, uh, I hear you. Um, no, it's, it, it, is, it is part of the history and uh, part of the story, which makes it so much more fascinating, right? Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, may, maybe that's something that I could sort of unpack into uh, some other other future interviews as well. Um, and then, and then when you look at, um, out into the space, do you have like a, a favorite punk personality or a, a punk identity that, um, that, uh, that you really enjoy watching and learning from and reading? Yeah. I mean, six, five, two, nine, his threads are always super insightful. Um, whether it's like about decentralization or the open metaverse, or just like some of his philosophies on life. I think he puts a lot of work into his threads and he's an excellent written communicator. And uh, so I, I absolutely admire the work he's doing um, sort of as a thought leader in the space. Um, and I know he's doing great things with his own like NFT fund as well. So um, yeah, he's definitely an inspiration for me. Amazing. Yeah. I think he's uh, he's a common name that keeps popping up for that question. Um, and if you were to describe punk culture in a few words, like what would that be? It's a tough one. I mean, I, I think it's a very curious culture. Um, it's a very curious culture. You know, you, you, you have people, actually, I'd say above all that, you know, there are people that are very curious about Web3. They're poking holes and like, you know, what what's really going on behind this like crazy speculative JPEG movement. Um, but there's also people that are just in there from an investment perspective. Um, what I think the punk community has is like, conviction like the punk community has like an incredible degree of conviction around these historical og nfts um and they have conviction that these things will be valuable um tomorrow as they are today more valuable tomorrow than they are today you know at the end of the day whether these people got in at one dollar or came in at one hundred fifty thousand dollars a pop it doesn't matter like these people aren't selling for whatever the value is today and so that tells me that they believe in a greater tomorrow. And um, I think that's like a whole lot of conviction. And, and you, could, you could frankly say um, the same thing about any holder of any project. Um, but I think the highest conviction people are the people that have held a project through all of the up cycles and down cycles. Like they've, they've, they've held their little token through all the winters and all the bull runs, and they're still here. And, and they're not just here, they're actually accumulating more. And I, I, I feel, uh, and I, I can't necessarily back this up with data, but I bet it's true on chain. You have more people in CryptoPunks holding their tokens for a longer amount of time and increasing their holdings over time. Whereas other collections, you know, you have people entering and exiting because a lot of these collections aren't going to last the test of time. And so these people are trying to time what is ultimately a pump and dump of some sort. And so punk holders, I think, just have a very high degree of conviction, not just on crypto punks, but the space as a whole. And, and, and their conviction takes the form of a position in the crypto punk community. Beautiful. Well said. And uh, if you could pass on a message to the next owner of your punk, what would you like to say to them? Hmm. I would probably say... Congratulations, son. <laughs> this, 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 this punk is going to, uh, this punk is going to my son, uh, or, or my daughter. You know, I, I view this as like, you know, I'm Valco, um, first of his name and like, there will be a Valco second of his name and it will be my kin. Um, Valco.eth and punk7642 are, are not leaving, um, me and my bloodline. So, uh, the other punks, you know, I would say congratulations. Glad the punk found a new home, uh, kind of thing. But uh, yeah, this, you know, this, this is the beginning of a a new legend. I think. Beautiful, mate. I, if I were you, I would um, check if Valco Junior is dot uh, is still available when you get off the uh, get, get off the line. Oh yeah, yeah. I gotta gotta snag that before you publish the uh, podcast. <laughs> um, awesome and. Um, and, and any sort of closing comments from your side and, um, and you know, how, how do people find you? How do people reach out to you? Any, any ask for help or, or anything like that? 
Yeah. Um, I think my Twitter is like my best hub. So it's just uh, at punk7642. My alias is Valco. Uh, I append that with a little uh, emoji lightning bolt. It's like my favorite emoji. Um, so yeah, just follow me on Twitter if you want to see cool threads. I post like one to two threads a week on um, NFTs, DeFi, and, and crypto, um, privacy, and just like freedom in the metaverse and on the digital frontier um, with really like the goal of onboarding like the masses and educating the normies or the non-crypto natives. So um, if you're interested in that type of content or know people who are crypto curious, um, send them my way and then always um, happy to have like a dialogue, uh, whether that's like on a Twitter thread, Twitter DM, Telegram message, like whatever. Like I'm, I'm trying to crack the code on like, what is the broader public missing here to have the same conviction and bullishness we all have. And that's a formula that I'm like really trying to crack and solve. And I don't view it as something I can like, it might be something I can formulate an answer to. Um, but I really much view it as a collaborative effort. Like I, I need to study um, a whole lot of people, a whole lot of things, a whole lot of psychology to really help make this idea um, and the space stick so that we can reach like blockchain ubiquity and, and worldwide adoption. So if those things excite you. Um, definitely follow me on Twitter and would love to have a chat. Awesome. And uh, I'll put your links in the show notes uh, as well. Um, but definitely I've had a lot of value reading a lot of your threads too. I mean, you write and craft really um, insightful threads. So uh, so thank you for doing that. Um, but uh, other than that, man, like I think that's a that's a wrap for Punkcast for today. Um, Velko, it was fun, uh, really fun for me and really um, – really insightful for me to sort of hear your story. So thank you for joining us for today's session. Yeah, totally. It was, it was super fun. Thanks a lot for having me, Maxwell. Happy to be back on here anytime or, or do a Twitter spaces together. You just uh, let me know. I'm around. Awesome. We'll do. I'll definitely hit you up on that. But, um, but for now, everybody, thank you for listening and um, I'll speak to you uh, next week. Cheers. Bye now.